Good Easter morning, Crosswinds. How's he doing? How are we doing, y'all? Wait, 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 wait. I think I'm missing something. I'm supposed to say something. Oh, wait, oh, wait. Uh, he's risen. He's risen indeed. Amen. God is good, ain't he? All right, good morning online. Thank you for joining us. We love you. Thank you. All the other areas in the church, let's go ahead and uh, come in as we begin worship. Everybody, let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to start worship, but before we do, we always pray. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, and your peace. Thank you, God, for dying on the cross for a wretched soul like mine and like ours. Lord, we thank you. We love you. As always, let the songs that we sing, we sing for you. Let our hearts be for you. And all that we do, we pray, we honor you. We pray all these things in your precious and holy and a magnificent son's name. All God's children say amen. amen. Let's get into amen. worship, y'all.
I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. go. Well, I'm sure I'm not the first and I won't be the last, but I do want to say happy Resurrection Sunday and praise God that he has defeated that grave and we can walk out of it. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're new and you're joining us for the first time today, we want to just extend a huge, warm welcome to you saying, hey, thank you for being at Crosswinds this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or you're joining us online. Uh, there's going to be a connect card. It's either in the seat in front of you or you can find it online as well. That will just get us a chance to, like it indicates, connect with you, get to know you. And also there's a free gift waiting for you at our cafe as well. Um, we're going to keep this nice, short, and get right back into praising. So only a few announcements this morning. Next Sunday, you're, all, you're invited to join us for the Step In class. This is going to be a meet and greet, an opportunity to get to meet some of the leaders here at Crosswinds. Uh, just ask any questions that you have. There's going to be a lunch provided and child care. It's going to be a great time. We'll get to know each other better. So if you'd like to sign up, uh, feel free. There's ways to do that. You can do it at our Next Step Center uh, through the app or our website. Uh, you can get plugged in and sign up for that. If you'd like to learn more about upcoming events happening here at Crosswinds, there's plenty of them or other ministries, opportunities, anything going on. Again, you can get plugged in from our app, our website, or at our Next Step Center as well. And then lastly, we are anticipating with great hope lots of people here this morning. So if you can, um, if there's room, if you can make your way to the middle of your section just so that we can have as many people come in um, as possible, if you can make your way towards the middle of the row you're in, that would be wonderful. But let's not sit anymore. Let's stand up and continue to worship. Amen. Amen. I 
there is all to know Nothing but you crucified Somehow in this room right now It is enough The weight of the world Too much for the souls of men But somehow you hold it all up on the cross Calvary's enough Calvary's enough when I know nothing when I know too much what I choose to know Flowing from your hands and side, covenant is sealed and ratified. You knew the cost. As the darkness fell and the temple curtain tore, the death I deserved, you made yours upon the cross. alone our hope is found. He is our light, our strength, our salvation. Wherever he will be, the Lamb upon the throne. Praise be to God.
Jesus is alive. He broke the curse of sin and death. And now we have a new beginning. New beginning in a kingdom that has no ending. Thank you, Jesus. With that everlasting life that you offer to those who believe in you. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the south side of the chasm, you had me in your side. So you What? 
We bring glory to your name, our risen Lord. Who for the joy set before you, you endure that cross. You despise that shame, that mockery. But we know on the third day he rose with power, splendor, and majesty, Lord. And this morning, how we want to worship you. We want to listen to your word this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, welcome to our church. It's Easter, and for us, that's a really big deal. Here's why. In our church, we believe that a guy named Jesus really walked the earth. We believe Pilate had him beaten, and we believe Peter denied him. At our church, we believe that Jesus was nailed to beams of wood. We believe that he shed real blood, cried real tears, and felt real pain. We believe the sky grew dark and the earth shook. And we believe that after six excruciating hours, Christ's agony came to a crashing halt when he breathed his last breath. We also believe the story didn't end there. At our church, we believe with every ounce of our being that Jesus walked out of the tomb alive on Sunday morning. Please don't ask us to shy away from that core conviction because it lies at the very center of our faith. And we invite you to check it out for yourself. At our church, we're not just going to leave the story there. We're not going to place it on a dusty doctrinal bookshelf in some church basement. At our church, we're going to learn to live today in full response to the empty tomb. And make no mistake about it, there is abundant life to be had right now for every person in this room. And it's all because 2,000 years ago, God took on human flesh. He lived and he died and then he lived again. And today, we are celebrating that event and the life it offers us. It's Easter. He is risen. Welcome to our church. Amen. I got to tell you, it's a little bit of a bittersweet morning for me today because a good friend of mine and mentor for many, many years, long as I've been at this church and even in a previous church, uh, Mary Lou Miller went home to be with the Lord yesterday afternoon. Yeah, you could say, as I was thinking of that, as we were singing, called, he called Mary Lou into, uh, who ran out of the darkness and into his glorious light, as we have been singing. And this morning, she is, she is celebrating resurrection after having been resurrected herself. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And when I, when I think about that, I, of course, we, we, we want to pray for Ellis, her husband, and the family. Uh, but Father, you know, that thing that she has been seeing her whole life and that we are seeing now through, uh, dimly through a, a glass, she is now experiencing it face to face. What a celebration that she is having. And that is available to every one of us. And that's what we want to talk about today. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us today? Would you share with us the greatest message, the greatest news of all time as we come to your word this morning? Lord, make it real to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Some of you are saying, wow, Pastor Willie, you have things other than Hawaiian shirts. And so <laughs> <laughs> it's Easter. And by the way, I'm wearing a Hawaiian tie, if you didn't notice. Yeah. Got, got to get Hawaii in there somewhere. So, um, you know, I think about Mary Lou, and, and I, I do a number of funerals, and people get up, and they talk, and they share, and, and I remember hearing about a group of guys who were standing around, they were talking about, what are people going to say at my funeral? And one guy says, well, I would hope that they would, would recognize that I was just a good person, a good humanitarian, I cared about people. Another guy said, I, I want to be remembered as being a, a good father and a good husband. That's what I want to hear at my funeral. And one guy said, well, I got something better than all of you, I want to hear, look, he's moving. <laughs> and you know what? That's, it took three days. We were here on, on Good Friday, and we intentionally ended pretty somber because it was pretty somber. But as we have, uh, have seen and will be seeing this morning in God's Word, Jesus has moved. And guys, if that is true, and I believe it is, and I hope to convince you this morning that it's true, it is something that we have to look forward to. And if it's not true, well, then life is a real bummer, is it not? 
I read that back in uh, 18, uh, 1815, actually uh, June 18th, 1815, uh, there was a battle called the Battle of Waterloo. And uh, Lord Wellington, uh, who was fighting on behalf of Britain and his troops, were fighting against Napoleon Bonaparte, whose goal was to take over the world. And they had rigged up a system whereby they would let people know what the, what the outcome of the battle was. Uh, and so they had this system of lights that they would pass from church to church generally. And it worked well. And ultimately, you know, the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon lost. And so they broadcast the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the message that Wellington defeated Napoleon. And they broadcast this from church to church to church with the flashing lights until they got to the English Channel. And apparently at the English Channel, the fog had come up. And so when they're reading the message, they didn't get the entire message. And all it said was, Wellington defeated. And everybody in England was distraught. And they were downcast because, of course, they've lost the war. Well, then at some point, the entire message came through and they realized Wellington defeated Napoleon. And then they had hope. Then they had something to look forward to. And that's what looking forward is. Looking forward is hope. And as we saw on Good Friday, the earlier Christians were like those people in England. They only had a part of the message. They believed a wrong message. Because at the end of Good Friday, Jesus is on the cross. He's dying. He dies. And he is defeated. Jesus is defeated was the message of Good Friday. But when the fog lifted on Easter Sunday morning 2,000 years ago, we got the complete message and we're singing about it this morning. Jesus defeated death. And, we, and that changed everything. It has changed everything, has it not? These days, a lot of people lack hope. We have a, a troubled economy. People struggle with their jobs. They have no friends. They have bad health. They've got issues in their family. And they really don't have anything to look forward to, or at least they think so. Maybe that's you. I know it's been me at times. Well, this morning, I want to clear away the fog, and I want to give you the complete message of Easter. If you have Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I encourage you to take notes this morning. We had some note cards that we gave out at the door. If you didn't get one, you can put your hand up, and one of our ushers will get a card to you. If you're joining with us online this morning, welcome. All the material I'm talking about is available on the church app as well. Just so you know, this is a letter, 1 Corinthians is a letter written to a church at the city of Corinth. That's why it's 1 Corinthians. It's the first of two letters, actually three, but we don't have the third one. And it was written by an early church leader, a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. And the city of Corinth was really big on Epicurean philosophy. And I'm not going to go into detail about that philosophy, just give you the basics. Basically, the Epicureans believed that this life that we have right now, this is it. There is nothing after death. And so what you have to do in this life is basically get all you can because this is all there is. Eat, drink, and be merry. Does that sound a little familiar? Probably many of us have friends or maybe, uh, maybe ourselves. Maybe that's how I am living or you're living this morning. The only thing to look forward to is what's going to happen this weekend or maybe I'm going to get a new car soon or, or we're going on vacation this summer. We've got a cruise coming up. And we get a little bit excited about some things like that. But Paul is going to tell them that there is something far greater that they can look forward to. And it's in his word. And the first thing this morning is we can look forward to the good news. Look at uh, chapter uh, 15, starting in verse 1. And it says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Now, Paul is going to talk about the gospel, as he says here. And the gospel, you know, we hear about gospel music and people have gospel meetings. The word in the original language is euangelion, and it means good news. And it's interesting, soap, by the way, was invented in the Middle East. And prior to that, they didn't have soap. Can you imagine a world without soap? 
<laughs> they would take these, these curved sticks and then they, they, they would scrape themselves. That's how they would clean themselves. So you can imagine how the early world must have smelled. <laughs> and it's said that soap merchants would go throughout cities and they would yell, euangelion, euangelion, meaning good news. And if you lived in a world without soap, without deodorant and antiperspirant, then the arrival of soap was really, really good news. Well, later on, Christians like Paul here would go from city to city and they would yell the same word, euangelion, and they would yell it so in order to indicate that you can not only be cleansed of the dirt that is on your skin, but you can be cleansed from the stench of sin that is in your life. And they, were in they began to be called euangelitases, which is translated evangelists. Verse 2 says, by this good news, by this, this, this great news, you are saved if you believe it, if you live in it. If not, then, it, then what you do, he says, is in vain. I mean, think about it. In, if we use the soap analogy, in order for soap to be effective, you've got to scrub yourself with it. You've got to work it into your skin. In order for the Christian life to be effective, you have to live it. Otherwise, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Live like the rest of the people here in Corinth which is why the resurrection that we are celebrating today is so vital. You see, guys, Christianity is not just a nice belief system because if there is no resurrection, there is no system. So here specifically, the apostle Paul tells them, is what the good news is. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance, that's the gospel, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So what he's telling us here is, first off, he didn't make up this good news, as some people say. I have heard people say, well, the apostle Paul came up with all this. No, he didn't. He says right here, I received it as of first importance. He received it. And in fact, in the book of Acts in the Bible, we read how Paul actually received it from Jesus Christ himself after his death. The resurrected Christ actually shared this with Paul. And the good news that he's telling us here has three parts. Number one, the first part is Christ died for our sins. That's a historical fact. That no, no, his, no reputable historian would deny that. Jesus died for our sins. Secondly, he was buried. And again, proof is something that, that, that is there for that. He was buried. There was a tomb. Uh, there, there was all of the, the things surrounding the, de the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. And the, the important aspect of the burial of Christ is it proves that Jesus was in fact dead. It's not that he was hung on the cross and he woke up and he walked away having never died. No, he died. They put him in the ground. They know the difference between a live body and a dead body. And then the third point is he rose on the third day. Well, what do you think about that? And he goes on to say all of this was foretold according to the scriptures. And if you go through the Old Testament, you'll find over 300 prophecies, 60 major prophecies of just who the Messiah is going to be. And they were all fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ. That is, there's amazing odds. It's, it's beyond uh, comprehension. It's beyond possibility that all of these prophecies, all of this foretelling of who the Messiah would be would all fall on one person, unless it's true, of course. I said myself 47 years ago, okay, dead and buried, I can believe that. I mean, after all, you know, we've got records of that. So yeah, dead and buried, but I'm not too sure about this thing about rising from the dead. Come on now. <laughs> Harry Houdini, probably the most famous magician that ever lived, uh, he was a guy that was a famous escape artist and magician. And he died on Halloween night of 1926. And he promised before he died to carry out, if he could, the greatest escape of all. He promised to come back from the dead. Guess what? Hasn't happened yet. And to this day, his followers, those who, who uh, revere him, still meet on Halloween night to hopefully be there when Harry Houdini comes back. 
but it hasn't happened yet. But guys, that is not true of Jesus Christ. Not only can we look forward to the good news, but we can also look forward to the proof of the good news. It takes, in a court of law, two eyewitnesses to establish a fact. Now, a lawyer would love the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They would love to have this case because look what it says next. Go to verse 5. And Jesus appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now you count those up, and by my count, we're talking about 524 witnesses that, who saw him alive after he was dead. Now, how can I call this proof? Because after all, this happened 2,000 years ago. Well, that's because it is historical proof. I have people still that say, no, I want scientific proof. But scientific proof is not something you can get from a historical event. Science requires that you can recreate an event in a controlled environment. But history, no point of history, the, 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 the Battle of Waterloo, uh, the fact that you got up this morning cannot be proved by science. It can be proved, how? By testimonies by eyewitness accounts or by witnesses who saw what was happening. And there are those who wanted, trust me, to end Christianity. The religious leaders were going through the book of Matthew uh, in, uh, in church here. And one of the things we see is that the religious leaders were always after Jesus. They wanted him in the tomb. The, the Romans were after him. They wanted him in the tomb. And all they had to do in order to end Christianity, because they even recognized that, that this following of Jesus Christ is starting to get momentum. It's starting to get traction. It's becoming a threat to, uh, to our, our, our uh, way of life. Well, all they had to do was produce a body, and yet they weren't able to do it. You see, before this movement got, got legs, they could have brought the body out, they could have shown everybody, and they would have ended the, all the resurrection talk right there, but they couldn't do it. I learned about an interesting point of history that I had never heard this before, but are, do, do you know that after he died, there were people that questioned whether Abraham Lincoln was actually in his coffin, in his tomb? And do you know that Abraham Lincoln's body was exhumed over 17 times? And six of those times, they opened up the casket just to make sure he was in there because people had said the body was stolen. It's not there. And they verified it. And finally, in 1901, they put it where it lies today and they poured uh, uh, tons of concrete over the top of it so nobody could get into Abraham Lincoln's tomb anymore. But six times they verify, and you can look that up, by the way, if you're thinking, I've never heard that. I hadn't either, but it is true. It's, you look it up. You know, there's a thing called Google. It'll tell you all about it. <laughs> but do you think the guys wanted Jesus dead any more than, than, than people wanted to be sure that, that Abraham Lincoln was dead? Far more. I mean, the, the, the movement that was building surrounding Jesus Christ was so, such a threat to them that, again, all they would have had to do was produce a body. And yet three days after the death of Christ, is, uh, rumors began to spread throughout the area. Only this time, guys, there were no witnesses who could say that they had seen his dead body. To the contrary, there were many, at least as we see, 538. Uh, and, and there's more than that because they didn't have a tendency to count women in the crowds back in those days. So it, it's probably double or even more than that. But all of these witnesses, and you notice as Paul says, some of them have fallen asleep. That means some of them have died, but most of whom he says are still alive. If you want proof, go and talk to these people. Go ask them. And he's saying that at a time when it could have been proven, and yet nobody had came out with any credible evidence that Jesus Christ had in fact died. As great a man as Lincoln was, there were witnesses to prove that he was still in the grave many years after his death. And if President Biden were to cry out this morning for help from Abraham Lincoln, there wouldn't be an answer. But if someone calls on Jesus Christ, guess what, guys? He's there for us. Why? Because he lives. And that brings us to our final point this morning. We can look forward to the truth. 
Paul now uses a bit of logic to make his case. Look at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul here is saying, okay, come on, guys, let's be honest. He's just proven by all of this eyewitness account at a time when, and he wrote it at a time when you could still go and physically talk to these people who were not going to deny what they said they had seen. And Paul is saying, look, come on, let's be honest. To deny otherwise is to deny a fact. But he goes on further and says, don't just take my word for it. Again, they're at a time when they can still check it out. And so he says, go and check it out. Go talk to these people. Go ask them. And then he gives a series of what we call if-then statements. He says in verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. Those are big ifs. And Paul has shown, has to, had to be shown these facts himself. Jesus actually pre presented these same facts to Paul himself. And the point of all of this is to prove the, 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 the basic point that Jesus Christ is alive. Guys, come on. It's the only honest conclusion that can be made. The witnesses made it. And trust me, guys, it cost them. They were beaten. They were martyred. They were shunned. They were ridiculed. And right down to this day, martyrs, people have continued to be, uh, to be uh, uh, beaten and, and martyred and killed for their faith. Maybe some people would die for a lie, but all of them? You'd have to believe that this is a massive plot, a plot to deceive everyone until their dying day. I am not going to tell the truth. I'm going to keep up this, uh, this, this fantasy that I have built up. Many of us are old enough to remember the Watergate scandal. And if you're not old enough to remember it, it's in the history books. You probably know about it. It brought down a president. And it was somewhat of a conspiracy. There was an inside group of people that were involved in the Watergate scandal. Uh, and one of those guys was a guy by the name of Chuck Colson, who went on to become a believer in prison, and he founded Prison Ministries. And Chuck Colson was the uh, special counsel to the president. And one of the things he talks about that convinced him of the reality of the resurrection was this whole idea that somehow all these people that said Jesus was alive and then suffered because of it couldn't all be just lying. I mean, maybe some real fanatics would suffer to death, but every one of them? And in his book, Loving God, he talks about this. He says, even the, the prospect of jeopardizing the president we'd worked so hard to elect of losing the prestige and power and personal luxury of our offices was not enough incentive to make this group of men contain a lie. We're talking about, you know, maybe a dozen guys. After just a few weeks, the natural human instinct for self-preservation was so overwhelming that the conspirators, one by one, deserted their leader, walked away from their cause, and turned their backs on the power, prestige, and privileges. I mean, he was involved in an actual conspiracy. We're all going to keep this secret to ourselves. And yet they couldn't do it because they were just faced with losing their reputations. Nobody threatened their lives. And so he says, you're telling me that these disciples of Jesus Christ who are faced with death, they all kept up the ruse? That's beyond belief. Paul continues in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all, are of all people most to be pitied. <laughs> Paul is saying here that if there is no resurrection, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the Epicureans are right. You might as well eat, drink, and be merry. You might as well live for the weekend or look forward to the things that you can buy to make your life a little more bearable. And you know what? I totally agree with that. I, I, I subscribe to that thinking. And, and I have dedicated my life to this message 
I have staked my life on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but I'm telling you this morning, if I found out that it's not true, if you could somehow prove to me that all of this that is true is in fact not true, I would leave it in a minute. I wouldn't be here this morning. I, can only, I can't imagine only accepting the resurrection as a nice idea. I hear people talk about, well, you know, it's a symbolic reality. It speaks of the, the, the resurrection of our spirits. Guys, it is not a symbol. It is a physical reality. It was never intended to be a symbol. It was intended to be a physical fact. And again, if it's not true, if the resurrection is not true, then the entire Christian faith is a farce. But I got good news for you. It is true. Amen? And not only is it true, it is far and away the single most important event in all of history. I totally agree with the Apostle Paul, both intellectually, both logically, and from my own experience. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, of those who have died. And on the day of Christ's resurrection, guys, death died. The, 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 the Mary Lou today is alive because of what we are celebrating. She's not only alive, she's more alive than us in many ways. I mean, she's experiencing what we are still looking forward to. And true life begins here in this life with purpose and meaning and, and hope for the future becomes possible no matter what you're going through this morning. Hope is now possible because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so I ask you again, do you have something to look forward to today? I know there are many people in this world who don't, and maybe that's you this morning. In fact, there are times when life gets me down, and so I need the reminders of what we find in this passage to get me back up again. Allow me to finish this morning by sharing with you some things that you can look forward to. I encourage you to take those note cards and turn them over. And on the back, here is the greatest news that every one of us in this room can look forward to. The first and foremost, of course, is John 3, 16. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves you. But the fact is, guys, we are sinful. And I don't have to prove that to you, do I? You know what you do. You know the things that you think. You know the stuff that you've done. And then the things that you would probably do if you thought you could get away with it. And the Bible confirms it. Romans 3.23 says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that results in us becoming separated from God. Romans 6.23, as it says here, for the wages of sin is death. That's separation from God. A perfect God cannot have have imperfection in his presence. And so we are separated from God. But guess what, guys? That's not the end of the story. No, God has given us a gift because that very verse continues. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Why is that possible? Because the, while the wages of sin is death and we owe that debt, Jesus died in your place, in my place. Romans 5, 8 says that God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He went to the cross. He was the perfect sacrifice that was able to die in our place. And we need to respond to that. It's not just a matter of, well, thank you, Jesus, for doing that for me. I, I appreciate the gift because you don't have the gift until you receive the gift. And Romans 10, 9 tells us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How do you do that? We call it the ABCs. A is to admit your need of a Savior. Admit this morning, yes, I am, I am a sinner. I am separated from God. I, I, I am deserving of death. And then B is to believe that Jesus Christ is that perfect sacrifice. He is the acceptable sacrifice. He is the Savior that you need. And his death will satisfy your debt. 
And then finally, choose. Make it your desire. Say those words that uh, Romans 10, 9 says. And not just say the words, but believe, even more importantly, believe in your heart what you're saying. And this morning, I encourage you to take advantage of this if you have not done this. In fact, in a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just that. What is stopping you today? I sat in your place, as I said, 47 years ago, and I heard this message, and I had been hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and saying, I need more information. I need to think about this. I need to work through this. I was a college student. I was, you know, I was an intellectual. I don't just fall for things. But I finally had to come to the point of saying, what more do I need? I keep coming to the same answer, that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, that salvation is exactly what I need, and that this is what I need to do. So what is stopping you today? One thing that made total sense to me was something that was said by a, uh, uh, an early mathematician, philosopher, scientist, kind of a Renaissance man, a guy by the name of Blaise Pascal. And he said this, in thinking about this opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, he made this, and it's, it's become known as Pascal's Wager. And to me, it makes total logical sense. If you believe and God does exist, guess what? You gain everything. You get eternal life. You're going to be like Mary Lou is right now. I can only imagine in the very presence of God, celebrating the resurrection. It doesn't get better than that, guys. But he goes on. He says, if you believe and God doesn't exist, okay, that's a possibility. He says, you lose nothing. I don't know, maybe you lived a clean life. Maybe, you, you know, you, you, you had good friends. Churches are nice places. People treat each other really nice here. I've had people say, even if this wasn't true, I, I like the Christian life. And so if it's possible that it's not true, you don't lose anything. I hope I've shown you today that's not possible, that it's not true. But nevertheless, Pascal's a, you know, a philosopher, so he thinks through these things. He goes on, though. Here's another one. If you don't believe and God doesn't exist, same thing. You lose nothing. Okay, there's, there's no risk here. But the final one is the clincher. If you don't believe and God does exist, <laughs> you lose everything. And so the odds are in your favor. And, and you say, I, I got to tell you guys, to some degree, that was, that was kind of the way I approached God, at least in the beginning. I was like, I, I, I've run out of arguments, Lord. I've run out of, uh, of dodges. I've run out of things I could say uh, to get out of having to make this decision. And finally, I just thought, you know what, Lord, if you're real, then, then be real to me. And guess what? He answered, and he's real. And this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to take advantage of the reality of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Heavenly Father, I want to pray with those that are here today. And maybe they've heard this message like I had many, many times and had kept dodging it. Maybe this is the first time that they're hearing it. And I pray, Father, that today would be the day of salvation, that today they would recognize that I don't want to lose everything by passing up this opportunity. Again, Father, you tell us in, our, in your word that we need to admit our need of a Savior. And Father, I would encourage them, if that's you this morning, you here in this room, admit to yourself, admit to God that, yes, Lord, I am a person in need of salvation. Do that in your own words. And secondly, The word says many, many places that if we believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. And so right now, just tell the Lord, I believe who your son Jesus Christ is. I believe he came to this earth. I believe the gospel. I believe that he died and was buried and was really, really dead. And he rose again on the third day. And I believe that if Jesus can do that, if he followed through on that promise, then I also believe he'll follow through on the promise to raise me out of the muck that my life has become. Share that with the Lord in your own words. Make that choice. Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you. I, I don't fully understand what all this is. I trust that that will come. 
But Lord, I know right now I need you. Come into my life. Do a work in my life. Change me, mold me, make me into the person you want me to be. I give you control of my life to become the person that you want to make me into. And I thank you, Father, for doing just that. In Jesus' name, amen. Linus and Lucy from Peanuts fame were watching television one day, and Lucy, in her typical way, says to Linus, Linus, get up and get me a glass of water. And Linus said, why should I get you a glass of water? What have you ever done for me? I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm here, I'm comfortable. You get your own glass of water. And she says, look, if you get me a glass of water, then on your 75th birthday, I'll bake you a cake. And Linus gets up and walks into the kitchen to get the water. And on the way, he says, life is so much more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. <laughs> and that's what Jesus Christ has provided for us. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together and let's worship him one more time. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Willie. Let's crown Jesus one more time. Crown him with many crowns. Forever he will be the lamb upon the throne. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing.
Amen. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. What, what good news we have right here. And if this is your first time hearing this good news and you have more questions, if you want more proof, if you want to know more about it, we're going to have some people up front here. And I encourage you to come up front, ask those questions. And if this is your first time hearing the good news and you say, this is truth, I am taking that step. I am choosing to believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is my savior, and that his death on that cross covered my sins, and that I can raise too, that I have that future to look forward to. If that, you've made that decision, please come up and let us know. We'll pray for you. We'll tell you next steps. We have uh, another service next week, the, the post-Easter service. I encourage you all to come to that and hear the next steps if you have just made that decision. So I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to give you some instructions about brunch and the Easter egg hunt. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank Thank you so much that because you live, we can face tomorrow, Lord, that we have that future to look forward to, that we know we can spend eternal life with you, Lord. And I'm so grateful that we get to celebrate that, not just today, but every single day, Lord, going forward, going into our world and sharing with everyone we know the hope that we have in us that we're looking forward to, Lord. I pray that you would uh, go with us so that we would go and share this good news with everyone we know and give us the courage and excitement to do that, Lord. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name. So instructions for the brunch. Uh, first, if you have kids, first go down the hall, pick them up where you check them in. You'll check them out. And then we're all going to, if you don't have kids, you could just make a left out of the sanctuary here. It's going to be your first uh, door on the left. They have the tables all set up. There should be people out front directing you. You're going gra to grab your food. You're going to go through a bit of a maze, but people are going to direct you. We're going to get you down the quad down here. So there'll be people giving instructions, but you're going to grab the food in these rooms right here. And then we're going to eat in the quad over there. And then around 1130, we're going to uh, all join in the quad and grab the kids. And then we're going to go on the Easter egg hunt. So if you have any questions, if that was confusing, there's going to be people out front. And they're going to help you with that. But we are going to have some elders up front. If you have any questions, if you need prayer, and if you, you've given your life to Christ today, please let us know. Happy Easter.